We have Jeff Hughes. Please put your hands together for Jeff as he spends five minutes telling us about his research. As will become quickly apparent as I continue to talk, I'm not from round here. Uh, I come from Canada and I came down here to um, study the, the Bell's turtle, which is that uh, handsome fellow on the right. Um, but uh, you'll be hearing more about Bell's turtles from another speaker later on. So I thought instead what I would do is talk about some of the uh, similarities and differences I've, I've noticed while working on your turtles compared to the ones up north. So to start off with, um, so in some ways Australia is, has greater turtle diversity and in some ways Canada does. So Australia has by far more species. So they have tw you have 24 species down here, but uh, most of them are in um, a single, oh, oh that's, that's what you meant by spotlight, okay. <laughs> uh, most of them are in a single family with only this, this uh, little fellow down here all on it by his lonesome uh, in another family. In Canada, we have only 10 species, but they're divided up into more, uh, a greater number of families. Um, so looking at uh, some of the challenges faced by turtles in Australia, um, you have three species that are critically endangered here, another two that are endangered and then another two that are vulnerable. But the majority of your turtle species are not listed um, as being threatened. Whether that means that they're actually not threatened or not, I leave that up to uh, others to decide. Um, so some of the challenges that they face are uh, human impacts on the land. So this is some of the, um, the sites that I've looked at over the past year and, so, and a bit. Um, obviously heavily impacted by agriculture. Uh, uh, drought is a big one. This picture is um, a picture of the mighty Gwider River that I took back in January. Completely bone dry. Uh, yeah, and you know, obviously things are only getting worse in that regard. Um, disease is a big, pro a big issue. Um, this is a picture of a Bellinger River turtle. These guys were almost wiped out by disease uh, about four years ago, back in 2015. Unfortunately, um, they are. Th there is some hope for them. They are um, hopefully um, being recovered by a captive breeding program, but we'll see. And of course, invasive predators like foxes are a really big issue. Moving on to compare to Canada, our species at risk listing is a little bit different from yours, but uh, we have three endangered species, one threatened, four considered special concern, and none that are considered not at risk. Two of them have been cons are considered extirpated, which means they're no longer found in Canada, but they're not extinct. Um, so obviously, winter is a big issue for a cold-blooded animal. Um, so some turtle species need to spend four months at a time just sleeping away. Uh, and uh, we also have ish our own issues with agriculture um, in a, a different, uh, different respect than you would find up here. Most of our agriculture, where I'm from anyway, is um, crops as opposed to pasture or uh, livestock. And uh, we have our own issues with invasive predators, well, not invasive predators, these are all native species, but they are considered subsidized, um, meaning uh, they do very well around people. So they live at unnaturally high population levels, and that has a big toll on prey species like turtles. So it's not all doom and gloom, thankfully. There is a lot of great work being done around the world for turtles, um, sea turtles, Worldwide, generate about 20 million US per year for conservation work. And then there's lots of other programs, including the one that uh, I've been working with here, um, Turtles Forever, which is a program, a uh, joint program between UNE, Northern Tablelands Local Land Service, and uh, the Office of Environment and Heritage. Um, I was told that Q&A comes later, but for now, enjoy this, uh, enjoy this gift. That's probably going to be me in a few decades. But. Four minutes, 40. Jeff's come in under time, if that actually contributes to your criteria for winning, so if you would like to note that. Thank you, Jeff. 
Um, on your table, you'll notice some small white slips. They are the voting slips for the students, so please take note of those. Also, you should have a pen on your table. Can everybody just let me know if you don't have a pen? If you don't have a pen, find one of your own. Actually, sorry, I don't have any extras because you'll need them for trivia. Or Siobhan up the back, who's got her hand up now, has extra pens if you need. If you need. Thank you, Jeff, for kicking off with turtles. I actually just want to mention at this point as well that University of New England have um, a really a big contingent of environmental and earth science researchers. And in fact, um, I've been told that the, they have the biggest group of paleontologists in the Southern Hemisphere. Is that right, John mm. and Marissa? Something like that. So if you are interested in doing those kind of things, ecology, environmental research or paleontology, stick around in Armidale. Next we have Amelia Redfern and Amelia is going to be changing over to some maybe some more familiar farm animals. Please welcome Amelia. Bringing a new life into the world and caring for it until it can care for itself is no easy task, irrelevant of your species. You need to feed it, clean up after it, educate it or get someone else to do that for you for a few moments of peace. For a lamb, the most important moment in its life the moment that will help determine its future is the moment it's born. However, newborn lamb mortality is still a big issue across the world. The causes are numerous and seemingly difficult to tackle. In Australia, the number one reason a lamb doesn't survive the first days of its life is due to a difficult and prolonged labour. The lamb has a higher risk of developing brain damage the longer the labour takes, and this can affect the lamb's ability to get up, have a drink and follow mum. As sheep don't have uh, an OBGYN on call, we do need another solution. So what if we could predict a difficult labour? We could provide assistance to the lamb and the ewe before it's too late, giving them the best chance to survive and thrive. So that's where I come in. I'm currently in the second year of my PhD, and part of it's involved with looking at the behavioural differences between ewes with a normal labour and ewes with a difficult labour. I wanted to know if ewes performed a specific behaviour or behaviour patterns that might indicate a difficult lambing event. Additionally, we wanted to know if we can pick up these behaviours or behaviour patterns with a motion sensor attached around the ewe's neck. So we did just that. We took our ewes and fitted a movement sensor similar to a Fitbit and put it around their necks. We moved them into a paddock with 10 video cameras recording every single thing they did. A breach of privacy, maybe, but a necessary breach. For each new lamb, I watched the videos from the first sign of lambing up until the lamb was born and classified the labour as normal or difficult. After watching many, many hours of these videos and annotating them in detail, we got this output from our extremely cool software. So the, the black lines are gone, but they are a bit crazy, these graphs, so just bear with me for a second. The top graph here is pretty plain, pretty boring, Bottom graph, if you can see just from here down, is a bit more busy than the first one. So the top graph is an annotation for a normal labour. These marks along the top are just short behaviours like pawing the ground or aggression towards another U. And the coloured bars represent longer behaviours like pawing, uh, sorry, um, lying or walking. So this U was pretty relaxed. Maybe she's done this before. The bottom graph, however, is an annotation for a difficult labour. This ewe was up and down and all over the place the whole time. She was definitely not relaxed. <laughs> we found that in the five and a half hours before the ewe, was the, the ewe lambed, um, ewes that would have a difficult labour performed on average two times more behaviours per hour. So we wanted to know, can our sensor data pick this up? And as of Friday last week, we know that yes, it can. We found that the sensors gave us the same, the same result as our behaviour annotations, that the ewes with a difficult labour were significantly more active in the five and a half hours before they lambed than ewes with a normal labour. So this is a really exciting result because it means that after some optimization by our resident tech geniuses, um, students like me can um, avoid watching hundreds of hours of lambing videos and instead watch funny cat videos to, to fill up all the time we'll have. So if our sensors can pick up these difficult labours, we can figure out a way to alert the farmers to go and help before it's too late. This way we can save the lives of our little lambs and keep their mums happy and healthy. Thank you.
Students are too efficient tonight. Amelia's also come in under time, a little bit more so than Jeff, so note that down. <laughs> um, okay, next we have, uh, moving on to birds. Lucy, you work on birds, don't you? Lucy, Far oh, sorry to Stu Thunder, sorry, that's supposed to be your slide. <laughs> Please welcome Lucy Farrow. Beautiful. So we all can relate to this moment when you're so nervous, so stressed, that you can literally feel your mouth running away from your brain. You're so stressed that you feel nervous in your hands, you're all clammy, you can feel your brain cells pretty much giving up on your mouth. They are trying to ring alarms, they're trying to bring out the emergency, anything to make you shut up. Meanwhile, while this is occurring, you're not picking up on the cues from those around you. You're not hearing the words they're saying or the tones that they're using. And you're definitely not recognising the expression on your partner's face begging you to please stop talking about milking cats. <laughs> this is natural. It's fine. Most animals are incapable of recognising one another in stressful situations. But humans can do it to some degree, even though in emergencies we aren't very reliable. That's why they say that witnesses can't be used in court some of the time. But I'm going to introduce you to a bird that can do this. It's the bird you love to hate, the noisy miner. So these guys are actually native to Australia, but the reason we hate them is because they're noisy and they harass those birds from your garden that you love, like your blue wrens. But I find them interesting because they possess the toolkit for intelligence. Now, this toolkit is what's uh, brought up to explain why humans and primates are so smart. And in your toolkit, you have tools like longevity, diet flexibility, social learning, and focal complexity. Noisy miners have all of this. And what my research has proved is they have functionally referential alarm signals. So they have different calls with different predator types and to also explain what that predator is doing. Now this is particularly interesting because in my PhD, I'm also establishing that in stressful situations, not only can they recognise an alarm call as being terrestrial or aerial, they know exactly who's producing that call. And as an example, they have a chur call, which is pretty much their war cry. And it sounds like this if it works. I bet you all recognise that because that's pretty much what they're known for, right? Ah! Ah. <laughs> Let's act like that didn't happen. Moving on. <laughs> so that churkle actually recruits individuals to the area and they can then choose to form coalitions, which unlike the Australian government, actually get shit done. <laughs> so, they co co <laughs> so they chase predators out of the environment and then they also cooperate to exclude competitors. Now, as ecologists, we find this interesting because they're very adaptive. And as we know, there's certain politicians out there who aren't too invested in the environment. So the more an animal can adapt, the more likely it will succeed. Noisy miners are exceeding at this, and we want to know why. And the reason we think so is because they're actually capable of possessing those tools for cognition. So they're able to adapt faster than other species like your region honey eaters. But the other component of my research looks at why this is the case for them and not other birds. We're thinking it has to do with the brain. But the current theory is that brain size matters and that the bigger the brain, the smarter you are. That's a noisy minor brain. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a peanut. <laughs> so we're starting to think maybe size doesn't matter in these guys. And the remainder of my PhD is looking at if size isn't important, maybe it is how you use it. We haven't been lied to our whole lives. Perhaps they're shoving more neurons into the amount of brain that they have, and this is allowing them to adapt. And at the end of it all, I hope from tonight and maybe from my research, we'll start to appreciate the fact that noisy miners hold the key to success. They can tell us a lot about what cognition could do for species that are in danger, 
And maybe when you go home, you'll start to pay a bit more attention to them. So I'd like to thank my wonderful supervisors who put up with me, UNE and Holsworth for funding, and of course, all of you guys for being here tonight. Cheers. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I think I will probably go home and recognise those calls <laughs> tonight too. Actually, can I ask you a quick question before you sit down, Lucy? Um, are noisy miners still really active during winter? Or could we expect to see them in the same abundance? Oh, they breed during winter. Great. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, and uh, Lucy came in under time, so we're, we are actually well within time to ask a lot of questions. Um, and so for our last student speaker, I'd like to introduce Lou Streeting, who is actually... We, we got the memo, actually, I didn't have my jacket, but we got the memo to dress in black tonight. So anybody who would like to join us? Yes, there's Sonia, got the memo too, where are you? Yes, up the back, thank you. Um, and Lou Streeting is going to tell us a little bit more coming back to turtles. Thanks, Lou. Can I have my first slide? Sorry, thank you. Uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, I'm here today to talk about my research into Bell's turtles. We're extremely lucky here on the Northern Tablelands to share our rivers with an amazing and ancient creature that occurs nowhere else in the world. The Bell's turtle has skin like a dragon, big webbed feet, long claws, lots of lumps and bumps and tubicles, a permanent smile, and a nose that I think looks a lot like that of a dog. <laughs> and as an added bonus, their babies are extremely adorable. Bell's turtles are a short neck, saw shell turtle and unlike the more common and co-occurring eastern long-necked turtle, they don't smell really bad when you pick them up, which is kind of lucky for me. And they spend pretty much all of their time in the water. So you won't see a Bell's turtle migrating across the land or crossing the road. Bell's turtles have been around for a really, really long time, but unfortunately they're now endangered. Um, and uh, heading towards extinction. They're a long-lived species, so they can live to at least 40 years, uh, possibly to over 100 years. Uh, they're a late maturing species, so females don't lay eggs until they're 20 years old. Luckily, currently, there are still a lot of adult bells turtles in our waterways, but Unfortunately, the population is ageing and not many juveniles are making it into the river systems. This is a time-lapse video taken at one of my study sites and it shows female bells turtles coming up onto the bank to uh, nest uh, on a rainy afternoon in November. You can see, I think, about four female bells turtles uh, digging nests to lay eggs, and you can also see other turtles in the water scoping out the bank. Unfortunately, we now think that uh, successful recruitment of juveniles has all but stopped in some areas, with uh, juveniles making up less than 1% of the populations. Foxes are raiding Bell's turtle nests. This uh, footage taken also at my study site shows a fox raiding three bells turtle nests in the one night. Over the last two breeding seasons I've found that more than 95% of bells turtle nests are raided by foxes within 24 to 48 hours of the eggs being laid. So my research project is looking at three conservation strategies to um, try and prevent or bypass fox predation and aims to get more juvenile turtles back into the rivers. So the first conservation strategy uh, involves the protection of Bell's turtle nests. So I put uh, mesh, wire mesh or steel cages over the Bell's nests to try and keep the foxes out. 
But unfortunately, the bell's nests are quite difficult to find. So I'm using camera traps and I'm working with a detection dog team from Canines for Wildlife and they help me to locate the nests. That's Max and Bunya, by the way. So this footage uh, shows a fox trying to get into one of my protected nests. She spends about 20 minutes here uh, before she finally decides to move on. So the mesh keeps the foxes out uh, and after about 80 days of incubation in the riverbank, uh, little tiny hatchlings dig their way out of the ground and scamper down the bank and into the river. And on the left side of the screen, you can see some wild bells hatchlings coming out of one of my protected nests. So far this season, I know that more than 300 hatchlings have made it back into the river from those protected nests. The second conservation strategy that I'm trialling is the rearing of hatchlings in the laboratory. So over the last two seasons, I've incubated, oh, sorry, not incubated, induced uh, 29 wild females to lay eggs and I've incubated the eggs and produced just under 400 healthy hatchlings. When those hatchlings are a couple of weeks old, they get a unique mark and they're put back into the river at the point or the site where their mother was originally caught. And the third part of my um, research is looking at another strategy, head starting hatchlings, keeping them in the lab until they're 12 months old to get them to a more predator resistant size. Uh, and so at the 12 month mark, they'll be um, given a uh, radio transmitter so that I'll be able to track their growth and their movement and their survival. Uh, in any conservation program, it's really important to inform and where possible involve the community. So the turtle release the hatchling turtle release days have proven to be an excellent opportunity to involve primary school kids. So far, uh, uh, kids from uh, Katingle and Kingstown and Bendemir pub, uh, primary schools have put turtles back into the river, into their, the river in their areas, um, and they've learnt about caring for the environment and looking after our native animal species. Um, my project is funded by New South Wales Environmental Trust and is an excellent and um, rewarding opportunity to be involved in a project that aim, aims at, that's aimed at making a positive difference and putting, um, increasing juveniles in the population. Um, and if any of you think that you may have Bell's Turtles on your property and you would like to be involved, please contact Local Land Services or the UN University of New England and find out how you can help. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Um, can they also contact you tonight? Yes. <laughs> or contact Lou tonight. <laughs> Great. Um, what I love about those four examples of research that are happening at uni is um, really is upholding the value of biodiversity. Um, biodiversity conservation is a really big theme in the research out there um, and also the communication of the value of biodiversity in ecosystem functioning. We're really lucky to be surrounded by agricultural land but also national parks in here so um, researchers at the university here have all sorts of landscapes as their playgrounds and as their experimental laboratories so it's really nice to be able to hear some of that research and I'm really glad that that was bookended with turtles they're really cute <laughs> even though they're at risk I feel yeah I want to help <laughs> so we're, we're now going to move on to micro things going from big animals that we can see turtles sheep birds micro fossil paleontologist Dr Marissa Betts has just come off five weeks in Germany where she's was undertaking research with collaborators um, overseas she asks to forgive her jet, possible jet lag tonight but she's a wealth of information Marissa is going to move us into the paleo earth science world please welcome Dr Marissa Betts Thank you very much for having me. I know we're under a time constraint, so I'll just get straight into it. Oh, cool. Well, I'll just take my time then. Um, yeah, like um, like we said before, I have been away for a little while um, and doing some research on um, these fossils. So I'll talk a little bit about the sort of research that I do. And then I've also got a few slides at the very end describing the kinds of research that I was doing while I was away because um, I was sort of building this talk while I was away, so it was all in my head, so it's nice to be able to share some fresh research with you. 
So these are, I work on a, a group of fossils called the small Shelley fossils. Um, it is a descriptive term for a, a very broad um, uh, assemblage of different kinds of organisms. Um, this is a, a picture that I produced for um, a poster actually for South Australia. They are early Cambrian small Shelley fossils from the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, which is where I've done the majority of my work in the past. It's difficult to see because of the scalloped edge at the bottom of the screen, but there's an increments down on the bottom. They are millimeter increments. So the whole bottom of the slide is one centimeter and each of the fossils is scaled down to that. So most of my fossils are under a centimetre in size. Actually, most of them are only a millimetre or two um, in size. But they're very important fossils. Small shelly fossils represent animals that evolved to biomineralise some of the very first complex skeletons that we see in the fossil record. Um, so uh, they are part of a really important part of what we know as the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian is a, uh, a period of time, over 500 million years ago, and the Cambrian explosion wasn't a literal explosion. It's a, a metaphor for the explosive uh, evolutionary event that happened at this time. And during the Cambrian explosion, we see the evolution of a whole lot of different types of animals. And um, most of the animals that we know about in the modern day have their evolutionary roots over 500 million years ago back down in the Cambrian. The Shelley fossils are a really important part of the Cambrian explosion, um, which wasn't just about the evolution of different kinds of animals. The, the Cambrian explosion was also about the evolution of really complex ecosystems. So it's the very first time that we see uh, complex evolutionary relationships like predator-prey relationships, for example. And developing a Shelley skeleton is really good for defence. So the Shelley fossils tell us an interesting story in that respect about the Cambrian explosion. But being able to biomineralise hard parts is also important for uh, evolving bigger, stronger and more complex bodies. So the development or the, the evolution of a controlled biomineralisation of a skeleton is a really important element of the Cambrian explosion. So we often talk about multi-element animals. Um, if I go back, most of these things are what we call multi-element animals. Their, their skeleton is made of more than one part. There are a couple of shells here that just had one, one element. So there are a couple of mollusks, one down here and, and one here. And their uh, skeleton was just one piece. So they're, they're related to um, modern snails and things like that, very ancient relatives. Um, and so their exoskeleton was just that one cap. But most of these things actually had a skeleton that was composed of several different pieces. And we call them multi-element animals. So each, each different piece of the suit of armour we refer to as a sclerite. And mostly we find them disarticulated um, in our Shelley fossil assemblages. And it's our job to try and put that puzzle back together. And I often do think of it as a puzzle, um, a puzzle with uh, a very small puzzle and you're not sure if you have all of the pieces. In fact, you probably don't have all of the pieces and you certainly don't have the picture on the box to work to. So it can be um, a pretty big challenge to try and put these things back together. In life, the sclerites would have fused together or articulated in some way um, or sat in the flesh uh, of these organisms to form their external armour. And they disarticulate because when the animal dies, the soft parts rot away and the shelly fossils disassociate from one another. The entire skeleton is called a sclerotome. So each individual part of the suit of armour is a sclerite. The whole thing is the sclerotome. This is not a great, um, it's very difficult to see there, but this is a, um, a reconstruction of what the world might have been like during the Cambrian, the different tectonic plates. So you can imagine the world 500 million years ago was probably a very different place to it, what it is today. Um, and the tectonic plates have moved quite a bit. Um, can everybody see where Australia is in this diagram? Yeah, we're up there. So it's a bit of an odd, they've put the equator here, just I think to show better the, um, 
the continents. But Australia in the Cambrian had more of an equatorial latitude. Um, so we certainly have geological evidence that the climate was very tropical in Australia and we had a nice warm climate for these shelly fossils to live in. Australia was nestled in uh, the supercontinent Gondwana and we had very close neighbours of Antarctica here, North China and South China. Um, and we know that we were close because the Shelley fossil assemblages from these places are very similar. Um, conversely, there are other, other continents, um, paleo continents, and our Shelley fossils are very different. So we can infer that those places were further away. So these tiny fossils can tell us some really big stories about what the world was like a long time ago. I wanted to talk a little bit about fieldwork as well because um, when I introduce myself as a paleontologist, most people think immediately about this film and everybody knows what this movie is, right? What is it? Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park, which is a great movie and it's done a lot of great PR for paleontology and um, especially vertebrate paleontology. Um, it's even probably fetishised the science a little bit. Um, and particularly when it comes to field work, people assume that I go on these digs and, you know, it's a bit like this um, scene from the first movie where they're crouched down over what appears to be a perfectly articulated velociraptor skeleton and they are using their paintbrushes to very slowly brush away the dirt from the skeleton. Um, but of course our fossils are very tiny so our field work looks very different and it looks a lot like this. <laughs> It's not even a joke. This is actually, these are actual field photos. This is down here in the bottom corner. That's my PhD supervisor, Glenn Brock at Macquarie University. He's in Antarctica there, actually, which is why he's all rugged up. So he's looking for Shelley fossils in Antarctica. Um, they're not all super tiny. Often we don't actually see them in the rocks, but um, they can be large enough to see with the naked eye. If they're complete beasts of a centimetre in size, then we will be able to see them or if they're preserved in a special way. So that's a mollusk in the corner there, and he has been infilled with a mineral called phosphate. Actually, the shell is completely gone, but now it's been infilled with a special mineral and the mould is more resistant to weathering so we can still see it. In the middle as well, there are these um, uh, sponge-like creatures that built the first uh, reefs which the Shelley fossils used to live in. So they're of often quite obvious, and so if we can see those, they can be a good flag for us to sample for Shelley fossils. How do we get them out of the rocks? Well, it's actually it's a pretty simple process. The rocks that we are aiming for are limestones, and the limestones will dissolve in weak acids, so we just use, we just use vinegar. And so we put our rocks in vinegar for a week or so, and um, it dissolves the rocks, but it leaves the fossils behind because they're made of a different mineral. And essentially all we do is just we wash the sludge that accumulates at the bottom um, with water. And then once that's dry, we pick the individual shelly fossils out with a very tiny paintbrush and a low-powered microscope one by one. So that's how, that's how our field work and our lab work works. And if we're very lucky, we will uh, come up with an assemblage that looks something like this. Did it get very dark all of a sudden? <laughs> um, is it fading or is it just me? I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, what we really need when we look at the Shelley fossils is high-powered microscopy. So we use a, a scanning electron microscope to get the really um, fine details of these things because that's important for us for identifying them. And then, of course, the fun can really start with, for us to try and put those puzzles back together and use them in applied ways. So the next couple of slides are, are about the sort of work that I was doing while I was away. I was collaborating with a colleague in Berlin and he works a lot on small shelly fossils. Um, I've got the Australian stuff and he's got things from China and Kazakhstan and other places. So we thought we would get together and look at one particular shelly fossil. And it's this one right at the top corner there. Um, and it's called Microdictyon. And Microdictyon um, has been known about for a long, long time. And they were finding these little plates, um, tiny little plates. That scale bar here is half a millimetre. So um, we're finding these plates, we've got them in South Australia, North China, South China, first described in the UK, also in Kazakhstan. 
um, and they have these really cool net-like sort of shapes with holes through them. When you get up close with the scanning electron microscope, they have these kind of crazy mushroom sort of shaped nodes around each of the holes, and each of the, the nodes can have cool sort of uh, bumps and pimples and stuff on them uh, that people have used to designate different species, which is probably a bad idea. Um, the plates as well also have sometimes they get doubled up. People didn't know the kind of animal that produced these things, but a little clue for us was that we find these doubled up sclerites. That's not an accident that they are sitting like that. Um, we've got an old sclerite on top of a younger sclerite. So it's telling us that this was a molting animal. So that's our first clue about what it was. So the, the animal was undergoing some sort of molting process and it was caught in between that and we've got the older one still sitting on the younger sclerite before it popped off. So a big mystery for a long time until this fossil was found um, in South China in the Chengjiang Lagerstadt, um, Lagerstadt in South China. And I was lucky enough to be able to collect there um, a little while ago. Lagerstadt's just a German word that's been um, co-opted by paleos. It means the jackpot. And um, so a, a, a fossil Lagerstadt is like where you find some really, uh, really special fossils. And the Chengjiang has fossils, uh, Cambrian fossils that include their soft parts as well. So normally it would be most easy to fossilise the hard skeletons and um, of course the soft parts will be very easily destroyed or rotted away. But the Chengjiang and several other Cambrian sites will retain the soft morphology so it gives us a lot more information about what these animals were like. And when they found Microdictyon they realised it looked like this. This is the reconstruction down in the bottom left. So Microdictyon actually was this soft kind of wibbly worm-like creature that had these kind of strange legs um, and each of the plates were actually like cool shoulder pads on, on top of each of the legs and they occurred as like pairs down the body. Uh, ten pairs of legs but actually nine pairs of sclerites, so two pairs of legs underneath one of the sclerites. And it was actually related, it is actually related to the modern group of um, velvet worms, so they, they're part of a, the similar, a similar group. And so Microdictyon has been thought of as one of those sort of um, success stories, a small Shelley success story where we had the individual sclerites didn't know what they were and now we've got the body fossil and we know it's a squibby, wor squidgily worm like with thing with legs. And so, you know, job well done, everybody can go home and don't think about Microdictyon anymore. Um, but there's still lots of questions that uh, remain unsolved about Microdictyon. And that's sort of what I was in um, Berlin to do with my colleague. And so what we were trying to do, what we did um, really was look very closely at the individual sclerites. And we wanted to know how they were made, how the animal actually built the sclerites. And so what we did was, well, we basically destroyed quite a few of them um, in the name of science. Uh, we smashed a few to have a look what was inside um, and we put some in acid. Um, so I felt like, you know, if you've got to break a few eggs to make an omelette, really. Um, but he has several hundred of these things. So we selected the, f the couple that were not so good looking um, so we could, we could kind of have a bit of a, you know, break them open and have a look inside. Um, I guess a lot of people would be re reluctant to do this kind of work because it takes a lot of time to find the fossils, extract them. They're also half a billion years old. Nobody wants to smash their fossils to have a look inside of them. Um, but we thought we would give it a go. And we found some really interesting stuff. So in this uh, picture down here, we can see different layers inside of the, the sclerite. And they have this capping layer on the top, um, which was probably like, you can think of it almost like as an enamel on your teeth and underneath was sort of a, a more organic rich, maybe a softer sort of layer that maybe was not as mineralised. Um, and we thought, well, I wonder what that looks like, this second layer underneath. And so we used some acid to etch away that enamel surface on the top and we found these crazy brush-like structures under each of the nodes, which um, I don't think has ever been documented before. Um, and that's a close-up of one of the little brushes. 
And on the top right there, we've sectioned one in resin and acid etched it. And so you can see those um, tubey sort of brushes um, from the side. And um, so really, I would like to be able to say that we wrapped up this uh, story in three weeks. But I went away with a few sort of major questions and came back with 44 more. Um, and really, we don't know what these brushes were. We have lots of new questions about microdiction. What were these things inside each of the nodes? We see them in the Chinese material, but also in the Australian materials as well. So they're ubiquitous in all of the sclerites. Maybe there's some kind of supportive structure. Maybe there was some kind of way that the animal communicated with the outside world. They could detect things, or maybe they could secrete something. Um, we just don't know. What actually were the sclerites for? <laughs> Why would an or a soft organism secrete 18 sclerites al along its body? Would it be for protection? Probably not. Um, if it's for a protection, surely you would build a, a, a sclerotome that covered the, all of the soft parts. They also malted these things. So they, would, they spent a lot of energy to produce these sclerites, but then malted them again and again throughout their lives and then regrew them. We don't even really know how it grew. A lot of molting animals will have different stages during their life um, and they will look different at each stage. But as far as we can tell, Microdiction started out small and just got bigger and we don't really know about what happens in between. We also don't know which end is the head. Um, <laughs> If you look at the literature, it just depends on which paper you read. If it's the like long sort of proboscisy bit, or if it's the bulb at the other end, like nobody really knows that either, and nobody knows how many different species there are. So there's still several questions um, to be solved with this particular Shelley fossil, um, and I'm pretty much done. But I would like to just say that some of these things might seem like very small, insignificant problems in the grand scheme of things, but actually it's very important to get these questions right because getting this stuff right has knock-on effects for how we um, tackle the big stuff. So things like how we interpret how the Cambrian explosion worked, how we can use these fossils to answer big questions like where the continents used to be. So the Shelley fossils, they're very small, but they can tell us some really big stories but we have to make sure that we get the small questions right first. And that's it. I'm done. No worries. Thank you, Marissa. I've got 44 more questions for you too. And I'm imagining if there are any mathematicians in the audience who really like, like right or wrong, uh, and those sorts of questions where you may never know the answer might just be really messing with your brain right now. <laughs> I, know, I, I really had that. But um, Marissa, I'd like to thank you. Um, and also, I can relate to the down on your knees looking down at the ground, really, like down at ants that I study as well. Now, our next main speaker tonight uh, is an ecologist. Dr Manu Saunders is... Uh, is focused on insects and ecosystem services. She's come to us from Charles Sturt University in the University of Queensland. And tonight she is going to talk about some insects and the ecosystem services they provide. I'm just going to do a little bit of a plug actually for um, National Bee Day yesterday, if you didn't know. Oh, sorry, World Bee Day, if you didn't know it was World Bee Day yesterday. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow Manu and her Twitter thread telling you a little bit more about native pollinators and native bees. So please do that. That's just my plug. And also, just in case she doesn't plug it, she does another amazing citizen science project called the Wild Pollinator Count. There was an April count that you've missed now, but also keep your eyes out because there's one coming up in November. <laughs> Were you going to plug that? No. Great. Okay. Now you do. <laughs> please welcome Dr. Manu Saunders. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, okay, tonight I'm going to talk about ecosystem services, which is the sort of broad research area that I work in. So it's a scientific fancy term that basically means uh, valuing nature, so caring about nature. So who eats fruit? Um, who likes going fishing? 
<laughs> who likes bushwalking? Who has a special nature place that they go when they're feeling a little bit crappy and want to feel good about themselves? Yes. <laughs> who appreciates the value of threatened species and fossils and what they tell us about science? Yes. So all of these things are ecosystem services. They're ways that we um, find ways to value and care about nature so that we can then do something about protecting it. Sounds a little bit familiar because we've been doing this forever, basically, <laughs> since humans were humans. Um, you know, we go back through any culture in history. We've got creation myths from Indigenous Australians and Americans. We've got um, classic European history. So, for example, Artemis here, goddess of the hunt. You'd pray to her when you went out hunting so that you knew you would be successful and you'd get some food. Uh, Demeter, um, goddess of the earth and the harvest, you prayed to her so that you got a good harvest and you knew you'd have food for the rest of the year. Um, through to medieval and modern England where we have things like the commons and um, you know medieval manors were built around natural resources that that was what sustained the community. Then we get to the 1800s, obviously there are more humans on earth, um, we're starting to overuse and exploit resources. We've got you know, one of the last giant redwoods that was cut down up the top there. Um, if anyone hasn't seen this picture before, that's a mound of bison skulls. That's a man standing on the top there for size. So this was the time when we had the birth of the conservation movement where people started to realise, hang on a minute, we're wrecking things, we're killing things, we're cutting things down, um, we need to do something about that. So this is when national parks were born. Um, who recognises these two places? Yosemite and, uh, yes, Royal National Park. I've got them both there because there's a little bit of debate about which one was the first national park in the world. Um, we'll say the bottom one. <laughs> Fast forward to the 1970s and of course by then we've got um, the effects of industrialisation, urban development, um, environmental health issues. People were starting to freak out a little bit about climate change. We, we had scientists working on that. We had companies like Exxon worrying about how climate change was going to affect their um, profits and so on. Um, so scientists started talking about, well, what are we going to do to stop this? And came up with this idea of valuing nature's services. The idea was that if we could um, value nature, show that, that nature provided these social benefits to society, we could convince politicians and businesses to do something about protecting nature. But then it wasn't until the 1990s when ecosystem services became established as a scientific discipline. So that was when we got a bit of a framework of this is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is sort of like the, the seminal framework for how to value ecosystem services and how to categorise them. And the discipline's kind of taken off since then. So it's very young discipline based on a very old concept. And the basic premise of it is that if we can value nature, if we can place values and identify values, different types of values on natural systems and the animals and plants that are in them, we can identify priorities for conservation and management. Unfortunately, nature's messy and complicated. Uh, most of the focus to date has been on economic value. Um, that's because it's easy to quantify, it's quite easy to come up with a dollar value for something, how much it costs, how much it, you know, we make money out of it. That's only one type of value. There are lots of different types of value and lots of different ways to value nature. And we need to understand more about the ecological values and the interactions underlying those values. So that's where my research is sort of focused. I'm interested in finding better ways that we can understand these ecological interactions so that we can value nature in a, in a more meaningful way. So I mostly work in agricultural systems because farms are ecosystems too. A lot of people might not think so, but they are. And no matter how hard we try uh, to keep animals out, we can't. Nature will never um, follow fence boundaries or uh, property boundaries. So all of these animals and uh, interactions are happening on farms and all of those interactions are producing costs and benefits and all these different things that happen across an entire year, which influences this final product, the yield, which is what we consider the ecosystem service. So we need to understand more about what's going on across that year, 
across multiple years how all these animals are interacting. Here's an example of how this system sort of works. So the humble apple, we all love apples. I have one every day. <laughs> um, the easiest way to value that apple is to come up with a dollar value. So how much you pay for it at the shop, how much the farmer sells it for, that's one type of ecosystem service value. There are also other ways to value apples. So they make yummy things, they have health benefits, they have cultural benefits. This is the pagan cider festivals that they have in England. So behind all those different values, there are lots of other different types of values for apples. I just couldn't think of any more at the time <laughs> when I was doing this. Lots of values of apples, lots of ways to value apples. But all of those values um, around this, this particular apple come from all the interactions that have happened in the orchard to produce that apple. So we have the pollinators that have pollinated the flowers that create the apple. We have all the predators and the parasitoid wasps and all the things that are eating the pesty insects that are damaging the apple so that we get a nice apple with no holes in it. The ones with the holes in it going to the cider. So <laughs> and we've got the birds, so there's in, you know, birds that eat insects, birds that uh, clean up the, the rotting apples so they don't spread disease. So all of these animals are living in the orchard and doing these things without most of us knowing about it. And they're helping produce this apple that we then identify value for. So insects are my favourite thing in the whole world, <laughs> which is why I focused on them here. Um, in orchards, uh, which is where I mostly work, insects are really, really important, but they're important everywhere. Insects are the most diverse and abundant group of animals on Earth. Um, they are more abundant and diverse than mammals and birds, which everyone loves. <laughs> There are about one million species of insect on Earth and an estimated four million more that we don't know about. I think there's only about 60,000 mammal species. Someone might correct me there. Just saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> insects are vital for ecosystem function. They keep our ecosystems stable and functioning and doing all the things that they're supposed to do so that we can enjoy the benefits from them. All these things and many, many more come from interactions between insects and interactions between insects and their environment. This is just an excuse to show lots of cool pictures of insects, <laughs> but these are some of the examples of some of our Australian insects that are performing all these wonderful, helpful ways that they help us. So we've got native bees, about 2,000 species of native bee in Australia. <sighs> lots of them in our gardens, you know, who's seen a blue-banded bee? Yes. <laughs> They're probably the most recognisable, but there are many, many more uh, native bee species. We've got wasps. I love wasps. Um, so bees basically just eat pollen and nectar. They're awesome pollinators because they're um, obligated to just go looking for pollen and nectar because that's what they feed their young. Wasps are really cool because they do lots of things. They need to eat pollen and nectar as adults, so therefore they're pollinators. They're awesome pollinators. But they also eat lots of pesty insects that damage our food. So they have multiple functions and they help us in multiple ways. Sawflies are another cool one that people often overlook. They're related to wasps. Um, we probably recognise them as these little spitfire things that hang around in clumps on eucalypt trees. These are the adult versions of them. They only live for about a week in March, so you probably have, may not have seen one. Um, but they're beautiful things. They're amazing pollinators and a couple of studies that have managed to find them, because they're really hard to find, have estimated that they're probably more efficient pollinators and, and carry more pollen than bees do. Flies, I absolutely love flies. Who loves flies? Come on. <laughs> they're the best. Hoverflies, blowflies, all these amazing different kinds of flies. Bee fly down the bottom there. Again, really important pollinators. There are a lot of crops that um, actually flies are better pollinators of those crops than bees are. Um, they're also decomposers, they're parasitoids of other insects, they do all sorts of wonderful things. Pfft. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Butterflies and moths, beautiful, lovely things. Um, these are a really interesting case actually because this is a classic example of where ecosystem services gets complicated because, you know, we like to label things, we like to say that, you know, bees are good, caterpillars are bad. 
actually, you know, most species can be both good and bad at the same time, depending on the system and the context. So butterflies and moths, classic example, a lot of their larvae are pests and, and cause a lot of damage in, in our crops, um, significant amounts of damage. But the adults are often very important pollinators in some systems. So we need to think about these dual roles and think about, you know, oh, caterpillars, if we want to wipe them all out, then we're not going to have any butterflies and moths. <laughs> Beetles, um, another really important group, and they're um, one of the most diverse of the insect orders. And again, lots of multiple functions going on here. Pollinators, decomposers, dung beetles, um, predators, etc., etc. There's a lot of love going on there. Anyway, sorry, I didn't notice that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so the thing with insects is they need habitat. So they're not like, um, because they're small and a lot of them, you know, even though they have wings, a lot of them can't fly long distances. They, they can only fly a short distance or for little short bursts. So habitat is really important to them. They can't just move to a better place if we wreck where they're living, like, like some birds and, and bigger mammals can do. So this is an almond plantation that I worked in once. Um, doesn't look very hospitable, does it? <laughs> um, not much going on there. There's not really anywhere for insects to live. So this is thousands of hectares of this, as far as the eye can see. Um, unsurprisingly, I didn't find very many native pollinators in there. Um, <laughs> this almond orchard, which was nearby, um, there were heaps of insects because that's perfect habitat. We've got nooks and crannies, we've got lots of plants, we've got dead wood, we've got all these little hiding places and habitats that these insects can quite happily get on with their life and get out of the way when the tractor comes and it's no big deal. So this is really important thing to consider when we're managing our landscapes, not just farms, but all of our gardens and landscapes is how we're managing it to provide habitat for these little creatures that provide all these benefits. Apple orchards, um, where I also did uh, some work. So I love orchards, they're great. Um, this is, uh, so most apple growers actually do leave ground cover, which is great, um, unlike the almond uh, plantations. So really interesting thing, we did some work in apple orchards in southeast Australia in three different regions. So Shepparton, Batlow and Harcourt, they're three of the main uh, apple growing regions. Um, we were looking for insects and birds and we measured yield and all that sort of thing and we did this across the whole growing season to sort of map what was happening um, throughout the season. And we found something really interesting that we had a mix of different types of management and that was the point to see if there's a difference between um, the landscape that they're in and the way that the growers manage them. So you can see um, these are paired by landscape. So the two up the top there are both from Shepparton. Uh, the two blue squares are Harcourt and the two green circles are Batlow. Um, so obviously, wherever they are in this graph, so the higher up here they are, the more pests and the less beneficials. And the further along here, the better the quality the fruit was. So obviously, this bit is the bad bit. You've got crappy fruit and lots of pests. So you can see that these two orchards from Shepparton were a lot worse in terms of the number of pests in the orchard and the quality of the fruit compared to the others. The really interesting thing about that was that this orchard was a certified biodynamic orchard. So technically, he was managing the most ecologically possible way you could. So he was doing everything right in terms of ecology. He wasn't spraying, he was, you know, had amazing diversity, plant diversity, he didn't do much management, it was great. But he had so many pests and the fruit quality wasn't really that great. And he had very few beneficials that were controlling these pests. Why is that? Because of the composition of the landscape. So who's been to Shepparton? <laughs> um, if you're not familiar with it, it is one of the most degraded landscapes in Australia. So um, the most recent estimates, some people from Melbourne did some work on native vegetation cover and there's estimated to be about less than 10% of the original vegetation cover left across that landscape. It's been completely cleared, covered in cropland, lots of chemical use. There's been studies done of the waterways around, around there that have really high um, 
chemical pollution in the waterways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So compared to Batlow and Harcourt, which even though they're both agricultural landscapes and they're both managed, you know, this is state forest here, of course. But you can see that there's a lot more mosaic of different patches. We've got patches of native veg. We've got different types of farms. Everything's a little bit more heterogeneous. <laughs> so there's a lot more going on. This is a lot more uh, consistent and everything's kind of looking the same and there's not much native vegetation around. So this is contributing to the lack of diversity in that region. And that lack of diversity then influences the production of ecosystem services, things like fruit production in that region. So this is why we need to be thinking at the landscape scale. It really helps to understand all these complex interactions. Um, you know, when we consider the little orchard in the middle there, it's not just an orchard with a fence around it and nothing else going on. It's connected to everything else in the landscape. If we take away that patch of native veg, everything else follows, no apples. So that's the end. <laughs> uh, essentially, ecosystem services is an excellent way to understand how we can manage our landscapes better. really stark contrast between Shepparton and Batlow in landscape services. Yeah, or landscape, sorry, native vegetation. Thank you. Please join me once again in thanking Dr. Marissa Betts and Manu Saunders. Now on the program is your drinks break. You have approximately six minutes to kind of stretch. <laughs> I know, sorry, exactly six minutes to stretch, grab a drink, sit back down because then we are going to have trivia. So make sure you get your heads together. Think about what Manu and Marissa were talking about and we'll get back into trivia. Enjoy your break. Anyone? Did anyone get full marks? <laughs> Ooh, okay. I'm looking forward to giving you prizes, great. All right, we're at Q&A for our speakers tonight. We had four student speakers and we had two academics from University of New England. I hope you've got some questions. Can I throw open to the panel, uh, to the audience to start questions? Because I've got lots myself, but I don't want to dominate questions. Has anyone got a question they'd like to kick off Q&A? Great, we have one. Microphone will come to you. Hi. Um, this question is about ecosystem services. How do you break down how much a wasp is worth to the dollar apple versus a bee or the, all the different insects that contribute? Great question. Um, I don't know. Uh, this, is, this is what um, the big question and the point of do, uh, doing this research is. So it's really hard to just come up with one value. So you really do have to follow all those interactions that are happening, which is why understanding the ecology of the system is important. So, you know, you, you can just whack a dollar value on it and I could say, oh, it's, you know, one wasp is worth 10 bucks per apple. But, you know, that means nothing if I don't actually understand what that wasp is doing, which is why we need to look at those interactions. Okay, another question from the floor. In the absence of questions from the floor, I'm going to keep asking, but Deb has a question at the back. Um, I actually have a question for Marissa while you're getting the microphone there. Um, Marissa, I'm really fascinated with how you infer function from the morphology of the tiny fossils that you've got. Do you mostly use what we know about extant species to infer function, or how do you do that with tiny little things you don't know anything about? Yeah, that is a really good question and there is an element of looking at modern day things to try and work out how the tiny little fossils live. I did one study a few years ago looking at uh, a creature that had two shells, or well, they call it a bivalved creature, um, and they thought that, or in the literature people thought that it opened and closed the two shells or the two valves to protect the soft body inside. Um, Actually, people thought that it mostly kept the valves open and we were finding them mostly closed. And so we thought, oh, well, they must be able to shut. But they didn't have a hinge or anything. So usually you, if you see animals like a pipi or, or something at the beach, they would have a um, like a hinge 
uh, or teeth and socket situation where you can articulate the two shells, but these didn't have that. And so we looked at it under the microscope and we could see that the layers in the shell just went all the way through. And so we inferred that actually they weren't necessarily that mineralised um, in the beginning. They were probably quite soft and that enabled the, the shells to open and close um, during life. So that's one way of doing it by trying to work out how the, act the thing actually worked I'm um, doing life. Yeah. That's like, you just can't, you want to go back a million years. Yeah. <laughs> I want to travel back in time 500 million years and go snorkeling, yeah. <laughs> My question is also for Dr. Betts. I'm wondering, was Microdictylon named by a really angry woman? <laughs> <laughs> and or if not, what what part of the structure of the animal gave it its name and its description? You know what, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, I haven't seen that paper. I think it's probably written by somebody a long time ago in probably Russian or something like that. It's probably named after a place or something like this. I, I'm, I don't know. But I, I often think that um, when I see the word, it is quite funny. Um, but yeah. Siobhan, do you know what dicti is in Latin? Does anyone know what the derivative of dicti is? Micro small dicti? Yeah, I don't know. No, we do, yeah. We did this in discovery though. That's a good question. That is a good question. Questions from the floor, Karen. Hello. Um, I've also got a question about microdictyon. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so the small sclerites that you identified, they were just sort of like essentially shoulder ridges from your description. Did you, after finding the uh, complete animal, identify other sclerites that were from that animal and sort of put the puzzle together mm. more, a bit Great more? Great question, because this is what I'm also trying to do. So we do notice down the length of the animal that the, the shape of the different sclerites changes in different positions on the body. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the challenge for us is to work out how the shelly fossils from the residues, um, how we can link those back to the body fossils. Mm -hmm. And so I think that might be the key, is to look at the sort of general morphology of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's yet to work to be done. Okay. And that's what we'll be doing, yeah. Cool. One at the front here. Um, and I, while we're doing that, I was really interested that there was a pagan cider festival, actually, <laughs> myself. Um, Manu, have you got any more information of where we can find out about this pagan cider festival? Yeah, we should just start one, yeah. Um, apparently, so it's called the Apple West Sale, and I don't know if I pronounced that right, if anyone can correct me. Um, but it happens in most cider orchards, as far as I can tell, in the UK. So if you want to go to one, just... Hop on over and, and celebrating. It's generally it's the harvest. I think it's around the harvest time, and it's there's it. It's one of those things that started. It would have had a different significance in those times, and they've kind of just adapted it for a let's all get drunk and dance around in the fire, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, down the front. Um, mine's yeah. Also for Dr. Pet. Sorry, everybody else. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and coming off the back of the other question, does uh, is there any examples of um, things where you've looked at fossils and, and kind of compared that to a modern day organism? And, and while I know that a lot of them have evolved from um, organisms from the Cambrian, um, have there been times where uh, you've really come to the wrong conclusion by looking at modern mechanisms of animals? or? I'm not sure about um, like looking at the modern things and trying to compare. I mean, that happens a lot. They're, they're, they're very confusing. They're, I, I almost had a slide in there um, with uh, a different Shelley fossil, um, and it was another one of those success stories where they had the you know sclerites and then found the body fossil, but the body fossil um, actually was, looked completely different to what they had imagined, right. and um, it had lots of different little tiny sclerites on its body. And it was a worm-like thing with these sclerites along its back, covering it like the suit of armour. But at the head and the tail, it has these two massive shells, which people had described as a completely separate thing and thought that they were two shells that sort of got, went together in, in one animal. And they thought like, like some kind of modern bivalved creature. Um, but actually, they were just the head and the tail of this, uh, this crazy shelly fossil um, animal. So um, that was an, an instance where people thought, oh, we did not get that quite right. <laughs> Um, so always, always some surprises with the Shelley fossils. 
<laughs> um, can I ask also, do you have any, um, like any ideas of what those sclerites are? Any just imaginative like um, postulations of, of what those sclerites on the... The, on the um, microdictyon yeah, were? Yeah. Oh, look, I have no idea. I've spent at least, I mean, a long time thinking about it, but seriously, for the past three weeks, like every day, and still I'm not sure. <laughs> because actually the holes in it weren't really holes. They, they're holes now because they're not preserved very well. But actually, if you turn them over, some of them still retain these little kind of caps underneath each of the holes. So they weren't really connected to the outside. Um, people had suggested the coolest idea and maybe craziest idea was that they were eyes, that they had they were all different eyes down the length of the body. Some developmental problems with that. Um, cool idea though. Um, uh, people also suggested that maybe it was like a egg, a nest or something, like something had produced this um, mineralized thing and then laid eggs in it. Probably also wrong. Um, so yeah, don't know. <laughs> we'll keep working on it. <laughs> Yeah, anybody's got ideas, like throw them out. Yeah, like. yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is for Jeff. So you're saying that there's Canadian turtles that also are listed as vulnerable. Uh, any of those turtles in similar situations to the Bell's turtles and is there any management uh, tools over there that are used there that we could use here or that you know of? Or, and to you, Lou, it would be the same question. Uh, the turtle that I, the species that I worked with back home was uh, the wood turtle and they lived in, they both lived in, um, like the Bell's turtle, they live in uh, river systems. Um, but uh, the situation is a little different there because the main threat to wood turtles is actually um, collection for the pet trade. So we keep their populations, uh, they're, they're very closely guarded secret. Um, uh, in terms of habitat, like they, they're called wood turtles because they live in forests a lot of the time. Um, whereas there's very little forest cover up here, but the bells turtles, the, that doesn't seem to be causing too many issues with the bells turtles. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that there's uh, that many lessons that could apply other than just general. Um, turtle biology, which is um, protect adults because they're, um, you need to protect the adults because they need to be there to produce lots and lots of hatchlings in order to ensure that some of them survive to adulthood. Um, and uh, in the case of the Bell's turtles, we also need to protect hatchlings because <laughs> they're not making enough of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. And Lou, so there's the there's this age gap, this deficit in young turtles. And if females take 20 years to get to sexual maturity, uh, is the situation there's more males? And is that putting a pressure onto females that are sexually mature that you know of or anything that's like that? Uh, I don't know that there's more males than females. Uh, yeah, so in some areas there's actually fewer males. Um, males are mature at 10 years of age. Um, so that um, difference is not necessarily a concern at the moment. Um, it's more a matter of um, just getting juveniles into the system so that they can mature and actually start to nest um, and to somehow prevent um, predators from basically gobbling, gobbling up all the eggs before they get there. And um, with your first question, I'm just wondering, uh, Jeff pointed out that in Canada a lot of the predators are native but they're subsidised um, because they can go through human garbage dumps and things like that. Um, so the big problem here in Australia is foxes are introduced um, and so there are native predators for Bell's turtles but they've, the turtles have evolved with those predators. Um, so just bringing in this um, predator um, from somewhere else that just just goes nuts basically and devastates the population is what what's, what's happening here. Yeah. Right, thank you. Um, this is a question for uh, maybe uh, all of the turtle people. I also have the impression that over the last decade the long-necked turtle, I see fewer and fewer around, uh, of them around Armadale, especially crossing the road and being run over and whatever. Is this uh, indeed true that there is a drop in population around here and what is the cause for that? 
Um, I, do you want to answer? I know that, that sorry, I know that there's, that in some areas, um, long neck turtles are decreasing. Um, we've actually got a long neck turtle expert sitting over at that table over there. Um, <laughs> I think long neck turtles are also subject to um, predation uh, problems with foxes. Um, that was it. That was it? Okay. <laughs> Deb? Anything to add to that, Deb? Why, why aren't you up here? <laughs> <laughs> you can ask Deb up the back who's just about to put her hand up that could answer the long neck turtle. Yes, yes, yes. Microphone over there. <laughs> Oh, okay, since we're so interested in eastern long neck turtles, um, there is evidence that they have declined in river systems. So eastern long neck turtles are adapted to um, wetting and drying systems. So there's a boom and a bust that happens in, in floodplain systems. When it floods, all these nutrients are brought into the system and there's all these insects. And they're really good at exploiting those temporary resources. Um, we know in the Murray-Darling Basin that we've reduced those flooding effects, we've regulated the water, so there's weirs now, and so they don't respond in the same way that they did historically. So yes, there is a reduction in, in certain systems, but at the same time we have put in farm dams and sewage treatment plants and urban wetlands that those turtles can now live in. So whilst we've taken out one part of their system, we've replaced another that they can live in. Whether in local areas they've declined, like in Armadale, um, we don't have the data to say, but we are starting to trap local ponds so that we can look at those populations long term, and I'll be able to give you an answer in about 20 years. <laughs> uh, just, just to add on to that, we. We do catch long necks in our Bell's turtle traps and we do mark them so that we can uh, start to build a, a data set on, uh, on the, the long necks as well as the Bell's. I have a question for Amelia. Amelia, who's the expert in the secret life of sheep by um, <laughs> all her accounts. Um, two part question. So first question is, is there anything like any behaviours that really surprised you that, that you observed? Was there, was there something really odd or weird that you didn't expect? And the second part is how did you stay awake watching all that footage? <laughs> well, to answer the first, uh, the second question first, coffee, um, a lot of that. Um, there wasn't any behaviours that stood out. I think that's what surprised me most is that there were no really amazing things that sheep do. They just do a lot of boring things really so they're you know they're up and they're down and they're walking and they're stopping and they're lying and sometimes they'll headbutt another you or that's kind of the most exciting thing when that happens um but yeah they they just don't do anything different to each other they just do different amounts of things i think is is the most surprising thing Um, regarding the noisy miners, what features of the bird's brain allow it to be so communicative? Allow it to communicate that's so effectively? With that's the a really good question. Um, so we're not quite sure yet because we're kind of the first group to look at their brains a bit more intensely. But we're thinking it's to do with the structures. So when we, I didn't bring it into the talk today, but we're actually looking at the different sizes of the different regions in the brain. And we found that they have really large auditory bulbs. So we know that they're hearing the sounds a bit more intensely and they're also seeing the world around them a bit more than other species. So things like your homing pigeons have really big optic tectums, which means that they're able to see the world a bit better. And noises are also capable of that. So we're not quite sure yet, but it's something to do with their evolution. Um, they live in groups of over 100 individuals. So we know that every day they're interacting with someone different. And so there's a lot of selection pressure there. And we're kind of now looking at if the brain structures are different for them. Okay. That works. That's, that's very interesting. If I wanted to kind of keep up with what's being learned in that area, if I wanted to get more information on that, what would I do? Um, well, you can read my thesis, which will hopefully be done in about two years. <laughs>
time for bidding. Um, there was this really cool idea that I'm going to steal from the Sebra Finch people, though, where they took scans of the Sebra Finch brain and then they made it like a website and you can kind of click on different regions and see the different areas and how big they are or what they look like. And we're actually thinking about doing that with our noisy minor brains. So watch this space. So Will do. <laughs> Make make an account on ResearchGate and follow Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Oh, uh, Jeff, how did the turtles escape from Canada? Oh, so how did the turtles escape from Canada? How did they not there? Oh, extirpated. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well. Uh, so the, there's the two species that are extirpated are uh, the box turtle, which still lives down in the United States. Um, and they may have been hunted to extinction by native peoples a long, long, long time ago. Um, there are now some box turtles running around in southern Ontario, and those are probably released pets. Uh, <laughs> and the western pond turtle, which lives in British Columbia, um, they are also still found in the U in the southern U.S. Um, they were probably outcompeted by um, red-eared sliders, so uh, people releasing other pet turtles that aren't from British Columbia that um, sort of forced them out of their uh, out of their homes. Thank you. I, I'm actually going to ask a question that's not specific to any research in particular, but for all of you, maybe Bar Marissa, actually. Um, I sort of have been listening to the kind of data you collect, and it occurred to me that a lot of what you do is direct observation of organisms, of animals, whether it be watching hours of video or, or pollination services or what turtles do or what birds do. Can I just get a sense from you guys, actually, what proportion you think of your job is sort of taken up with direct observation of your animal to kind of think through and analyse what they're doing as opposed to this experimental part, I guess, in the, direct, the, the data um, collection? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I actually went to uni to be an ecologist because I wanted to work outdoors and I didn't realise that you spend a lot of time sitting in a computer so <laughs> um, I, but I think obviously I think when I did my PhD I spent more time outdoors observing than I do now um, but I think especially with Ecology and for insects and interactions, you can't understand them without watching them. And a lot of research, um, a lot of the knowledge that we have has come from someone observing an interaction in the wild, seeing an insect visit that flower and going, oh, I wonder why it's doing that, and then going and finding out more about it. So in a sense, uh, obs direct observation is absolutely critical to ecology and my sort of work. Um, but it doesn't necessarily always happen in work time and that's, I think, that a lot of my observation happens in my spare time and on weekends and in my garden and whatever and that's where I get ideas to then go and sit at a computer all day and <laughs> yeah. work on it, so. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Well, probably most of my time is watching animals because my PhD is on animal behaviour so we have to watch them to understand what they're doing. Um, but part of that is we're developing um, technologies that can do it for us so we can spend more time doing other things like actually looking at the data and analyzing it and getting papers written and all of those other fun things. Um, so that's that's one really big area of growth at the moment is is the technology to do that for us. It's still very early days but from just the, the small trial that I did last year, we've got some really promising results. So hopefully in the next maybe five or 10 years, we'll have these tools that can can predict behaviors and, and annotate them for us with a really high um, accuracy. Uh, for me, it's probably about half and half. So a lot of what I have been doing lately has been trapping animals and then uh, just taking measurements from them and marking them for uh, recapture and then releasing them. So that's kind of a, a snapshot of them. It's less to do with behavior and more to do with just taking physical characteristics of, of the population at large. 
but uh, in the near future, I should be also taking um, footage of captive animals and uh, observing their behavior. So that that'll be uh, a good chunk of observing the behavior. So through the video, through the video or pictures, and yeah. Um, I'm going to be honest, I quite like lab work now after doing field work because you don't rely on the weather and you don't rely on your birds doing what you want them to do. So I like bringing them into the field where pos uh, into the lab where possible, but I am going to bully one of my volunteers now, Quinn, who's in the front. Um, I've got two volunteers that come out with me four days a week for three hours every morning to observe our birds and what they're doing. So I think he can kind of um, justify the fact that there is a lot of observation involved, even when you try to go more lab-based with zoology. <coughs> Uh, Bell's turtles are f pretty shy creatures and so out in the field they're quite hard to observe um, unless you're really good at sneaking up on them. As soon as they get a hint that you're there they just dive into the water and they're gone. Um, but I do have thousands and thousands and thousands of photos on camera traps to go through. Uh, and also with putting lots of hatchlings back into the river I'm really keen to find them again so I am spending a fair bit of time trying to track them down again. Um, so if anyone sees any, can you please let me know? <laughs> Recruiting extra witnesses, that's yes. like crime TV shows, that's really Not great. Witnesses, accomplices. Accomplices, <laughs> sorry. I, I really love that that's brought up, you know, how humans um, develop technology to do the observation for us and also what we do in our spare time. I would, I, I would argue a lot of the environmental scientists and, and ecologists that we know at UNE um, are there because they're curious about how the earth works and how the organisms work. So actually Actually, whether you like it or not, you kind of find yourself drawn into these uh, observations that you make every day and asking questions about that. So I'm really like glad that drew out a whole heap of things and, and methods of trapping and lab work and, and also using volunteers. Now that um, is a nice way to end actually um, to be able to do some thank yous and announce our winners tonight of prizes. Could I please ask Danila or someone from, or Siobhan or someone from Pine of Science to come up please to present the student prize. <laughs> Great. So tonight everybody cast their votes into the box and they were counted. Tonight's winner is Lou Streeting of the Student Talk. Please put your hands together for Lou Streeting. Thank you. Congratulations. I think Lou you're taking the family to the movies on Pine of Yay. Science. Excellent. Charlie. <laughs> and trivia. Okay, and trivia, the moment you've been waiting for, for the Pint of Science beer glasses. The winner, hang on. <laughs> is, yeah, oh, okay. The winner is the group called Tiny Peanut Brains. <laughs> Congratulations. That's not the table you were sitting on, was it, Lucy? Uh, nod to noisy miners. <laughs> Great. Um, without moving the slides or anything, I'd like to do a few thank yous tonight. Thank you all for coming and experiencing the second night of three Pine of Science for 2019. Um, I'd also like to thank all the volunteers that make Pine of Science possible, which in the back of the program you'll see are hundreds across Australia. Um, in the room tonight though, we have our Armadale volunteers. Could you please raise your hand? There are UNE people, Regional Science Hub, CSIRO, in situ science and more. So thank you very much. The new Newstead Brewing Company sponsored Pine of Science nationally, so did CSIRO. In Armadale, the New England Northwest Regional Science Hub was in collaboration with everybody to bring this to life, which we also do science in the club. Armadale Golf Club, thank you for hosting this year. Belgrave Twin Cinema for prize donations. And Ian and Lucas, thank you very much for AV, which you've been doing for years very consistently. So um, thank you again. I'd like you to put your hands together to thank our speakers for tonight. that also get a present <laughs> and I'd like to do a bit of a plug for this um, uh, New England Northwest Regional Science 
Hub Science in the Club. The next one will be on Wednesday, the 26th of June at the Wicklow Hotel. Um, Mary McMillan and Deb Bauer will be coming back to reflect on their journey going to Antarctica last year. They were part of the Women in STEM leadership program called Homeward Bound. The idea is that a thousand women in STEM are taken to Antarctica over um, a number of years and they uh, we did a fundraiser for them at Science in the Club last year which was highly successful and so they did tell us they were going to come back and tell us what it was all about. So 26th of June at the Wicklow, please put it in your diary. Thank you again for coming tonight. Tomorrow night we have technology from fitness to farms. So if you'd like to know more about how technology is used in sports science and also in smart farming research from UNE um, will be presented tomorrow night with another four student speakers um, accompanied with beer, food and good company. So come and be science nerds with us tomorrow night. Thank you very much for coming to Pint of Science on the second night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.